Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome to cardiology lectures. I am Dr. Nick Nickham. I have been a cardiologist for more than 30 years at the Texas Medical Center in Houston, Texas. And today we are going to discuss one of the most important topics in cardiology and that is atrial fibrillation with rapid ventricular response, acute diagnosis and management. This is an important and challenging topic for the ER physicians, for the internists, the intensivists and the cardiologists and it is one of the most frequently encountered arrhythmias in clinical practice. So let us spend some time and learn the pathophysiology and the management of uh, acute atrial fibrillation with rapid ventricular response. As I said, I have been in practice for more than 30 years and I approach atrial fibrillation with the same intensity as I do in a patient with acute uh, ST segment elevation myocardial infarction or a patient with NSTEMI with hypotension. Because atrial fibrillation with rapid ventricular response uh, is uh, not a diagnosis per se by itself, but it is a reflection of the overall medical condition in a given patient in the intensive care unit or in the emergency room. So it is very, very important to find out what is triggering the atrial fibrillation with rapid ventricular response. This could be the first incidence of atrial fibrillation with rapid ventricular response in a patient in an emergency situation or it could be a rapid ventricular response in a patient with a chronic atrial fibrillation who under the circumstances uh, has many other underlying medical problems. When you see a patient for the first time in the emergency room in the intensive care unit or in the post-operative intensive care unit, it is important to do a systematic thorough history and physical examination to mainly focus on what is triggering the rapid ventricular response. So I make it a habit to find out what is triggering the atrial fibrillation with rapid ventricular response. Let us look at it from different systems point of view, cardiac, pulmonary, renal, constitutional symptoms and other systems and see how best we can deduct what is triggering the rapid ventricular response and then treat the underlying cause while at the same time getting medications to bring down the heart rate and support the hemodynamics. Let us look at cardiac problems. If the patient has a history of underlying heart failure, if there is an exacerbation of uh, heart failure, pulmonary edema, that can trigger rapid ventricular response. Similarly, STEMI with hypotension or NSTEMI with hypotension and other hemodynamic changes can trigger a rapid ventricular response in a patient with a new onset atrial fibrillation or chronic atrial fibrillation. Post-operative conditions are a prime status for patients to develop uh, atrial fibrillation. 30 to 40 percent of the patients who go for coronary artery bypass surgery develop atrial fibrillation with rapid ventricular response sometime during their hospital course. 70 percent of the patients who go for aortic stenosis surgery or thoracic surgery develop atrial fibrillation. It is not uncommon to see patients who go for abdominal surgery who have sudden shifts in their volume, blood pressure, electrolytes who can develop atrial fibrillation with rapid ventricular response and some rare causes are like pericarditis. Of course, patients with valvular heart disease like aortic stenosis, mitral stenosis, pulmonary hypertension can develop atrial fibrillation with rapid ventricular response with no reason whatsoever. Let us look at the pulmonary. Pulmonary is a major culprit in precipitating an atrial fibrillation with a rapid ventricular response in the emergency room situation or in an intensive care unit situation. Pneumonia, for example, which you do not think should 
be a major issue as far as cardiac problems are concerned. But if you are talking about development of pneumonia in a patient with a chronic obstructive lung disease, heart failure, hypertension, and history of coronary artery disease, that is a prime substrate for development of atrial fibrillation with rapid ventricular response. An increase in temperature of 1 degree increases the cardiac work demand by 13%. And for the same reason, bronchospasm with severe airway obstruction and wheezing can increase the work of the muscles supporting the respiratory system and in put an in extra demand on the cardiovascular system. Pneumothorax, due to reduced intrathoracic volume, can cause atrial fibrillation with the rapid ventricular response. Again, COPD is another important trigger for development of atrial fibrillation with the rapid ventricular response and of course pulmonary embolus can precipitate atrial fibrillation. Let us look at renal. Renal is important from two different perspectives. One major shifts in the intravascular volume from low to high depending upon the status of the patient's uh, kidney problem or the dialysis. At the same time kidney can also pose a problem with drugs that we use for controlling rapid ventricular response uh, in patients with atrial fibrillation. Vascular changes, high or low blood pressure, both are equally bad in terms of cardiovascular work demand and they can precipitate atrial fibrillation with the rapid ventricular response. I talked about volume changes, volume depletion which can occur with GI symptoms like flu or gastroenteritis. They all can add to the rapid ventricular response in a patient with new onset or chronic atrial fibrillation. Stroke, how can stroke cause atrial fibrillation? There are many reasons why a stroke patient can develop atrial fibrillation with ventricular response and some of these may be related to fluctuations in fluid intake, electrolytes and volume. But most often we come across a patient who has multi-system problems and all of which can be contributing to the rapid ventricular response in a patient with new onset or chronic atrial fibrillation. This is more a common presentation than an isolated incidence of heart failure, hypertension or a patient with pneumonia. Let us look further. When we are evaluating a patient in the emergency room or in the intensive care unit or in a post-operative unit, we need to pay attention to multiple telltale signs that can point to what is triggering the atrial fibrillation with rapid ventricular response. So we address the underlying problem while we at the same time control the ventricular response in chronic or acute atrial fibrillation. If the patient is having exertional dyspnea or dyspnea at rest, that suggests either pulmonary or cardiac problems that may be precipitating the atrial fibrillation. Same thing if the patient is orthopnic. Does the patient have weakness or fatigue which may represent chronic heart failure? Exercise intolerance can also suggest reduced cardiac ability to meet the demands. Decrease in urine output can suggest kidney problems, elevated creatinine, BUN, volume overload and these things can add up. And of course, leg swelling can suggest the presence of chronic problems like heart failure. When we are examining a patient, we need to examine the patient from multiple angles, from head to toe, to look like a detective for clues that can help us to pinpoint the exact triggering mechanism for the acute or chronic atrial fibrillation with rapid ventricular response. Of course, we are going to have tachycardia. The question is, what kind of tachycardia are we dealing with? Are we really dealing with atrial fibrillation with rapid ventricular response or is this atrial flutter with 2 to 1 conduction? Is this multifocal atrial tachycardia or are we dealing with a, actually a, a ventricular tachycardia at a high rate? Again, I talked about blood pressure. Both low and high blood pressure can contribute to atrial fibrillation with rapid ventricular response. Distension of neck veins can suggest the presence of heart failure, pulmonary hypertension. Rales and wheezing can indicate the presence of bronchospasm, possibly pneumonia and pulmonary congestion.
displays PMI could suggest the presence of uh, left ventricular failure and gallops may also add to the diagnosis of left ventricular failure. Of course, we won't be able to S4 gallop because S4 gallop is produced by the atrial kick or the atrial uh, contraction. Since we are dealing with atrial fibrillation with rapid ventricular response, uh, we may not be able to hear an S4 gallop. We, I put that there to let you know that it is highly unlikely that you can hear an S4 gallop in a patient with atrial fibrillation with rapid ventricular response, but that's not the most important point that we need to be worried about. Does the patient have hepatic enlargement, which may suggest uh, chronic heart failure, hepatic congestion, GI edema, which can lead to poor absorption of uh, cardiovascular drugs, which could have accounted for development of uh, pulmonary edema, fluid overload, and atrial fibrillation with rapid ventricular response. Cold and clammy skin would suggest reduced peripheral circulation. It suggests reduced cardiac output. It may be an indirect reflection of the left ventricular function in general. Okay, what are the drugs that are available for managing patients in an acute situation with atrial fibrillation and rapid ventricular response? First, we are going to look at each individual drug, its effects, and then we are going to conclude with a case presentation and look at how we clinically at bedside evaluate a given patient and choose the most appropriate treatment for that given particular patient given his history and clinical findings. In an acute situation where rate control is of paramount importance, where the vital signs support, uh, we can look at uh, diltazem, which is a calcium channel blocker, which can be given intravenously as a bolus, 15 milligrams IV bolus over one to two minute period. It can be repeated in 30 minutes and the bolus can be followed with an infusion of 0 0.005 milligrams per kg per minute. One of the main disadvantages of using ongoing diltazem in a patient with uh, atrial fibrillation with rapid ventricular response is that uh, diltazem is contraindicated in patients uh, with left ventricular ejection fraction of less than 40 percent. That is why it is very important to not only do the history, physical examination, but have appropriate diagnostic studies such as cardiac enzymes, electrocardiogram and most definitely an echocardiogram and chest x-ray and chest CT if needed so that you can really focus on what is triggering the atrial fibrillation with rapid ventricular response then focus on both treating the rapid ventricular response related to atrial fibrillation but also the underlying cause that is triggering the atrial fibrillation. The second class of drugs are of course the beta blockers which are the main drugs that are used in patients with uh, atrial fibrillation with rapid ventricular response mainly for control of uh, ventricular rate. Rarely do we ever use beta blockers to convert an atrial fibrillation to a sinus rhythm. The most commonly used beta blockers are of course metaprolol. It can be given intravenously 5 milligrams. Uh, uh, every 5 minutes up to a maximum of uh, 6 doses. The advantage is it acts immediately, but we need a supporting blood pressure to give metoprolol. However, metoprolol has to be used with caution in patients with severe obstructive lung disease, even though it is actually not contraindicated in patients with uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. One of the challenges with the metoprolol is uh, that it has to be given orally in an intermediate uh, stage and if the patient is intubated, if the patient has an NG tube, that poses a challenge. If the patient is able to take the beta blockers, then we can use metoprolol ranging from 12.5 to 100 milligrams twice daily uh, to control the ventricular rate in a patient with atrial fibrillation and the beta blockers also help in controlling the blood pressure and they are also one of the important drugs recommended in patients with uh, heart failure, either systolic or diastolic for that matter. Atenolol is another important drug 
which I have been using for more than 35 years, which does a wonderful job in a range, in a dose ranging from 25 to 100 milligrams, given as one single dose or in divided doses. And the advantage of uh, atenolol is, is it is longer acting and you get a much better control of uh, ventricular rate in patients with atrial fibrillation. And it is especially useful in an intermediate situation or in an outpatient situation where control of uh, ventricular response with atrial fibrillation becomes an important issue. Of course, the side effects of uh, beta blockers are well known. Uh, heart blocks, bradycardia, bronchospasm, hypotension, fatigue and impotence. There are times when you may help to stop the beta blockers because patients just cannot function. Digoxin is uh, often ignored by many clinicians and most people are not familiar with the value of digoxin in controlling rapid ventricular response in atrial fibrillation. So I would like to spend a few minutes and talk about digoxin. Digoxin was one of the main drugs that was available 20-30 years ago for patients with heart failure. It was also excellent drug in controlling ventricular rate in patients with atrial fibrillation. With the advent of new drugs, we have moved away from digoxin, but digoxin has certain advantages which the other drugs do not have. For example, digoxin can be given intravenously. It can be given on a daily basis as opposed to beta blockers which cannot be maintained intravenously on an extended period of time. Digoxin also helps in acute heart failure patients by improving the myocardial performance. Digoxin reduces the rapid ventricular response rate by increasing the vagal tone and it is easier to give digoxin but at the same time we need to adjust the dosage of digoxin based on the serum creatinine, GFR, body mass index and the patient's age. The usual dose of digoxin for control of atrial fibrillation is 0.25 milligrams IV one dose that can be followed with another 0.25 milligrams IV in six hours depending on the clinical response and the patients can be maintained on digoxin 0.125 milligrams to 0.25 milligram per day if the patient has renal failure or if the patient is on dialysis this dose can be given only three times a week. If we were to measure digoxin level, it is very, very, very important to remember that the digoxin level should be drawn six to eight hours after the last dose. Many times people give the digoxin and three hours later they draw a dish level. Oh, the patient is dish toxic. That's not right because you have to wait for six to eight hours for the digoxin to reach a steady serum level before we measure the serum digoxin level. For control of ventricular rate, in a patient with atrial fibrillation, we do not need to reach two nanograms of digoxin uh, level. We should be able to achieve a reasonable control of ventricular response rate with less than one nanogram per ml digoxin in the blood. Okay, let's take a real typical patient scenario and put all these drugs that we have talked about and how we can one manage this patient in terms of controlling the rate and also focus on dealing with the underlying problem. Here's a patient who is 73 years old male in an intensive care unit. You are called for a consultation. You are the intensivist. You are the primary care doctor seeing the patient for the first time or you are the cardiologist who has been called in to rescue the rest of the team. The patient has a chronic obstructive pulmonary disease with exacerbation, hypertension, coronary artery disease, bypass surgery and diabetes mellitus. Oh, look at here, the temperature is 101, pulse is 150 per minute atrial fibrillation. You are already given the diagnosis, so you don't have to go and monkey around looking for a diagnosis. Respiration is 26, oxygen saturation 80%. Blood pressure, oh, this is the only good number we got here, 130 over 90 millimeters of mercury. That's an important point because for me, when I'm treating atrial fibrillation, I don't want to make condition any more worse than what it is already in. Well, the chest has rouse and wheezing, 
has S3 gallop, liver is palpable, leg edema, ST depression in the lateral leads. So things are getting a little more complicated here. Echo, oh gosh, look at this. Left ventricle is dilated. That means this patient has chronic left ventricular systolic heart failure. Well, that is substantiated by the fact this uh, ejection fraction is 38%. Oh no, the troponin is borderline. The creatinine is not given here, but the creatinine is uh, 2.1. Is this enough? But in reality, this is a common presentation of a 73-year-old person presenting with atrial fibrillation with a rapid ventricular response. Maybe not this much, but when you sum up all the system problems, this is how a clinical scenario looks. That is why I said at the beginning that it is exceedingly important for you as an intensivist, an internist or a cardiologist or an ER physician to take a thorough history and do a complete examination and get all the lab tests, put them in a blender and come up with a composite picture of what is happening not only outside the body but what is happening inside the body, in the lungs, in the heart and in the kidney. When you have a global image of this person, then the next question is, what is your initial response to this patient with atrial fibrillation with rapid ventricular response and what is your intermediate response? You can pause the video here, write down your complete answer for initial response and intermediate response and when you are ready, you can proceed with the presentation. All right, now is the time for the truth if there is such a thing called truth. After being in practice for 35 years, I can tell you a treatment for a, a atrial fibrillation with rapid ventricular response, there is no single treatment. Whatever the option that you choose based on the overall global image of this patient externally and internally may be the most appropriate response in that particular situation under the circumstances you are evaluating the patient. What I'm trying to say is there is no single right answer for dealing with a patient with acute atrial fibrillation with rapid ventricular response. It is your gut or the heart judgment call. It is based on balancing the pros and cons of each and in each and every individual drug in a patient with a combination of medical problems that are interplaying one against the other. So here are your choices. Would you shock this patient? Is cardioversion the right treatment for this patient given the circumstances which we have talked about? Should you start with IV diltazem followed by IV diltazem infusion? Should you give IV metoprolol followed by oral metoprolol? Should we use IV digoxin followed by oral digoxin? Should we just treat the underlying cause? In this patient, we don't have one underlying cause. We have got multiple underlying causes. We'll go back and look at it again. Uh, don't worry about the rate. Should we start this patient on amiodarone infusion at 2 milligrams per minute IV? Or should you just blast the patient with uh, adenosine 6 milligrams IV? If that doesn't work, give him 12 milligrams times 2. What is your choice? Let's go back and look at the patient's history again and come up with a composite image of uh, what we are dealing with and then we'll come back and discuss the merits and demerits of each one of these treatment options. We are dealing with a 73-year-old patient with multi-system problem. The main problem here is COPD exacerbation with wheezing. In a patient who has coronary artery disease, some evidence of myocardial ischemia, borderline troponin, chronic congestive heart failure, and maybe perhaps superimposed acute exacerbation of heart failure with hypoxia and increased myocardial work demand. Keeping this in mind, let's get back to our choices and see. Should we be shocking this patient since there are so many problems? My option is no why this patient is not a candidate for shock first of all the patient has a stable blood pressure 
The heart rate is only 150 per minute. The patient has respiration 26, but he is not in florid pulmonary edema. So that would not be my choice. If the patient was hypotensive, if the patient was gasping for breath, then yes, I would shock this patient in a heartbeat. Cardioversion should be, be attempting cardioversion in a patient for a heart rate of 150 who has a stable blood pressure, whose uh, respirations are only 26, who is alert and talking. No, that would not be my choice. IV deltazem, 15, milli 15 milligrams bolus, followed by deltazem infusion. This may be a good option. See if we can bring down the ventricular response rate in a patient with acute or chronic atrial fibrillation. However, continuing this patient on IV deltazem infusion is questionable because deltazem is not indicated in patients with left ventricular ejection fractions less than 40%. This is one important factor where many clinicians overlook and put these patients on long acting oral deltazem purely for control of uh, ventricular response in a patient with atrial fibrillation because we have much better drugs to control the ventricular rate in patients with atrial fibrillation on an intermediate and long-term basis. Can we try IV metoprolol followed by oral metoprolol? This is also a good choice as long as the blood pressure is supported, as long as the patient doesn't have severe COPD with uh, severe wheezing but however this patient does have wheezing this patient does have hypoxia if we do use beta blockers we need to use them with caution and see what the response is if the pulmonary symptoms get worse then you may want to back off that's why you may want to try intravenous metoprolol to see how the patient responds if the patient is able to tolerate then we can think about using oral metoprolol Oral metoprolol, once the patient's pneumonia is treated, once the COPD exacerbation subsides, may be a choice because this patient has systolic heart failure. IV digoxin followed by oral digoxin. IV digoxin may be a good choice in this patient, but this patient also has kidney failure. So when we use IV digoxin, the advantage is it can be given intravenously if a patient is intubated or if the patient is uh, having a nasogastric tube. IV digoxin works within a couple of hours. It is long acting and it can be repeated if we need to in six hours. The dosage needs to be very carefully adjusted to the patient's kidney function. The advantage of using IV digoxin in a patient uh, such as the one we are talking about is, is uh, that it may improve symptoms of acute left ventricular decompensation and that may help to reduce the overall ventricular response in atrial fibrillation. All right, we talked about some of the common drugs that we have used that we can use for controlling rapid ventricular response in a patient with chronic atrial fibrillation, but let us not forget the underlying problems. We have pulmonary congestion. This patient needs uh, judicious diuretics to reduce the intravascular volume. The patient's blood pressure is 130 over 90 millimeters of mercury, so we can give drugs to bring down the blood pressure uh, to a more reasonable level. This patient also, of course, has uh, exacerbation of COPD with possible some infection and all these things need to be addressed uh, and we should not be focusing purely on getting the rate from 150 to 80 in a matter of few hours but taking appropriate steps to address all these different issues will eventually help to bring the cardiac work load down and bring down the heart rate as the pulmonary cardiac and renal functions improve. Amiodarone infusion is, is not the best choice in this patient and adenosine is not indicated for patients with a chronic atrial fibrillation or acute atrial fibrillation with rapid ventricular response because adenosine may help us to diagnose an underlying rhythm but if we already know the diagnosis adenosine is not useful because adenosine is mainly useful in patients with uh, 
paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia. So this is a brief overview of how I would approach a patient with uh, rapid ventricular response uh, with atrial fibrillation in an acute situation in the emergency room, in the intensive care unit or in the recovery room where there may be multiple factors interplaying and all of them need to be taken into consideration and then and then only make a prudent choice as to which drug you want to use depending on the urgency of a given clinical condition. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for watching. I am Dr. Nick Nickham and we will see you next time.